So all of the work, all of the new work I'll speak about today is joint work with Didier Smets from um, Paris. And uh, this is a quick outline of what I will discuss. And so um, I'll, I'll start by, after a very brief introduction, I'll go over the history of the problem I want to consider. Um, and uh, the problem I want to consider is, uh, addresses the uh, geometric evolution problem called the binormal curvature flow. And so, um, and so in, in some way, the main goal of the talk is to introduce and study a notion of weak solution. And so after reviewing basic properties, we will um, give this notion of weak solution uh, and then state several results and conjectures uh, based on the notion of weak solution that we introduce. Okay, and so the main um, subject of the talk is, as I said, this equation for binormal curvature flow, which uh, let me record it here. Uh, so here, gamma is a map from, um, it's a function of two, uh, two variables, a time variable and a, a parameter s, which is an arc length parameter. So, Okay, and so it's parameterized according to arc length. And um, so gamma is a map, say, from Okay, and so the time, uh, the time variable will take values in the real line or some subinterval, and the uh, arc length parameter will take values in the unit circle. So, uh, so I imagine that at every time, T, I have a closed curve in R3. Um, okay, and so the equation uh, is written as follows. And so uh, because, uh, because this S is an arc length parameter, then uh, d gamma ds is just the unit tangent to the curve. And uh, the second um, derivative with respect to arc length is the, is the um, curvature vector. And so what this says, if I have a curve, Uh, in space, gamma sub s is the tangent. Um, the second derivative, uh, the, the curvature point like this. And then the, um, if I take the cross product, I'll get a vector which is orthogonal to both of them. And, uh, and so this is the, the vector I'm considering. And so, um, Okay, and so one should imagine that if the curve is locally lying in, uh, lying in a, a plane to, uh, to second order, then the binormal vector is, uh, is orthogonal to that plane. Okay, and so then um, this, uh, this equation can be rewritten in slightly more geometric language, just saying that the time derivative of, of gamma is the curvature times the binormal. Okay. And uh, to give an example of, how, of a solution of this equation, if my initial data is a circle, um, then the, uh, of course, the tangent is like this. The, the normal vector will be in the plane of the circle and the binormal will be in the plane orthogonal to the circle. And so if the circle will move with constant velocity. Um, the velocity is proportional to one over radius. As the radius gets smaller, the curvature increases. Okay, and so that's um, the equation I want to consider. And so um, the place this arose originally is as an approximation to vortex filament motion in certain fluids in, say, ideal, um, ideal fluids in a certain sense. And it's also of interest as a sort of a an analog of the Schrodinger equation for curves. Um, okay, and so uh, let me start then by giving a history. And especially in the history, I want to focus on uh, how the equation, the, the study of vortex filament motions in fluids. So this story goes back to about the 1850s. Um, okay, so vortex motions in fluids was first systematically studied by Helmholtz, and the first paper he wrote on this was, a, uh, was published in 1858 in Krell's journal. Um, and here's something, well, first let me give the context. I'm sorry, I guess I should, I think I skipped a slide. Okay, good. So the starting point is this, uh, is Euler's equations Um, the starting point is Euler's equations for uh, incompressible fluid uh, <coughs> derived by Euler in the 18th century. 
And so here's the system. Um, uh, the, uh, one is looking for a solution u, which describes the local velocity of an incompressible fluid. So u is a function of space and time. It's a, and for every time, it's a vector field. Um, u is divergence-free, so this expresses the incompressibility constraint, and it satisfies this PDE, um, where P is the pressure, and so P and U are both unknowns here. And then the, the vorticity is defined in this fashion. And so the vorticity is supposed to, uh, to characterize the infinitesimal rotation of the fluid. Uh, the, vorticity is a, it, the vorticity is a vector, and so the direction of the vector will characterize the axis of rotation, and the magnitude will, will characterize the um, the rotational velocity, the local velocity. Um, so given a solution, we define the vorticity in this way. The vorticity then satisfies a certain equation. Um, so so from, from U we can, from the velocity field U, we can find the vorticity. Conversely, um, I'm sorry, this, this should be uh, U here. The, the velocity U can be recovered from the vorticity in this fashion via an integral kernel. Okay, and so this is, the, uh, this is the system that Helmholtz was studying in the 1850s. Um, before Helmholtz work, most of the uh, most work on the Euler equations had considered uh, vector fields u with the property that at every time u was the gradient of a scalar function, um, phi. This is what's called potential flow. Um, this is a very special case. And so Helmholtz was really the first to consider um, what happens when uh, when you drop this assumption, look at the more general conditions. Uh, and actually, he, one, uh, uh, an aspect of his motivation was that um, uh, what he was doing was, um, see, he, he, at, the, at that time, the Navier-Stokes equation had not yet been formulated. So the Euler equation on the previous slide is for a, a frictionless flow of fluids. Uh, and yet, um, people knew very well from, ex from experience that um, fluids have friction and that friction causes the generation of vorticity. And so um, he was one of the first to model, w without, without actually writing down an equation of friction, he wanted to model the, these frictional effects giving rise to vorticity and fluid flow. And so these are some of his con conclusions. Um, he would say, uh, uh, so no, no water particle that was not originally in rotation can be made. These are all quotations from a recent translation of this paper. Um, this is, uh, and so the second conclusion says, in effect, that if you start with a, so, he, so first he, he defined the notion of a vortex line and a vortex filament. A vortex line would be a, uh, an, integral an integral curve of the vorticity vector field. And he made the point that these vortex lines are um, somehow conserved by the fluid flow. If I, if I start with a vortex line at a certain time, then it'll be translated in the fluid. It'll, it'll, remain, it's, it'll retain its identity as a vortex line. Um, uh, the next point is that the vortex line uh, somehow has some, has some kind of invariance properties. The product of the cross-section, the velocity, is constant along the vortex line. Um, this gives rise to some, um, some sort of topological characteristics of the vortex line. It has to either close on itself or, or uh, reach the domain boundary. And so then, for example, he studied the motion of, of circular vortices, as we described a moment ago. Um, so it's actually quite an quite a, uh, interesting paper. He also, for example, described experiments that you can do with a spoon and a coffee cup, um, creating vorticity in a, in a fluid in your, uh, in your living room. Um, okay, and so this was really the beginning of our field. The, uh, and and this, pa this paper was quite, <coughs> was quite influential. And so uh, a bit later, Hel uh, uh, Kelvin began to investigate, investigate vortex filaments. Um, actually, he, uh, he wrote the first paper on this in 1880, in 1867, I guess, um, containing some theorems. He stated some results that he didn't actually uh, justify until a later paper in 1880. Um, and so one of the, uh, one of the things he did was to, well, uh, let me actually um, demonstrate with this numerical simulation. Uh, let's see. So uh, these are now these are uh, now called uh, Kelvin waves. Uh, all of the numerics I'll show is based on uh, numerical simulations written by my collaborator D. A. Smith. And so if we um, we said if I start with a circular with a circle, it will just move with constant velocity. Here I have a circular a circle perturbed by harmonic oscillations. These are uh, this is just a. Uh, uh, essentially sine of 10x. It's 
uh, purely in the vertical direction. And so what Kelvin observed is that these, or Kelvin gave a sort of a proof of the linearized stability of these. Okay. And so these are now called Kelvin waves. Um, so the point is these, these oscillations rotate along the vortex core while uh, the whole thing preserves its shape rather well. Uh, and so this was justified in Kelvin's paper in the 1880s, in, in 1880, after asserting it without proof in 1867. So, uh, and I should remark, Kelvin also developed a theory of what he called vortex atoms. And so Kelvin believed that, uh, that um, vortex filaments were somehow uh, fundamental to a description of nature, and that atoms were made out of vortices. And he also believed that the, um, the complexity, so the, the diverse behavior of different atoms could be explained by the um, diverse possibilities for knotted vortex filaments. Um, so this, this idea has, had, uh, has been pursued more recently in nonlinear field theory, such as the Skirm, the Skirm model. Uh, okay, and so then the, but I should say when, when Kelvin did this, he was working not with, uh, not with this equation here, which had not yet been derived. So he was working actually with, the, uh, with sort of formal analysis with the Euler equation, uh, the, the system we showed on the first page. So it wasn't until about uh, 20 years later, 25 years later, that this equation was formulated. So this was done by uh, Darius in, uh, in 1906. So he derived um, this equation. He gave a kind of asymptotic, uh, a sort of a formal justification for this equation as the law of motion for a, a thin vortex filament in an ideal fluid. Um, his work was mostly ignored, except by his advisor, who was Levi Civita, the, uh, the famous geometer. And um, Levi Civita, however, was very interested and actually returned to this question in the early 1930s, um, extending some of Darius' results. So, uh, but this, this too was mostly ignored as it happened. Uh, and so the equation was subsequently rediscovered several times um, by, by different groups. Um, Darius' computation went roughly like this. So he... Uh, so earlier, this is the law we showed earlier for recovering the fluid velocity from the vorticity. Um, here I'm assuming that the vorticity is essentially a measure uh, concentrated along a curve gamma. And so if you make this assumption, um, then one can do a Taylor series expansion uh, to second order, say, of the curve gamma, and, um, and then compute the first few terms in expansion for V of X. So the leading order term is huge. Uh, here I'm imagining that epsilon is the uh, thickness of the vortex curve. Uh, the leading order, order term is huge, it's of order epsilon to the minus two, but it's purely rotational, so it doesn't have any effect on the, on the uh, motion of the vortex filament. Um, the, next order, uh, the next order term is much smaller, but, uh, but has a net translational effect. So the, um, the binormal curvature uh, is this uh, second term in the expansion. And uh, let me emphasize, this only computes the say, the uh, instantaneous velocity, if we assume that the vortex filament uh, is there in the fluid, we, uh, this is the instantaneous velocity. So the, what it doesn't do is, um, when I say a rigorous justification is, is open, uh, from a PD point of view, what you would like is a theorem that says, uh, given a fluid with a vortex filament as initial data, uh, we would like to know that this law of motion um, actually describes the evolution of the vortex fluid, of the vortex filament, uh, for some finite time interval. Um, and that's, uh, that's what uh, Darius did not do and no one has done since. Um, this is only sort of the instantaneous velocity. Okay, so that's uh, sort of the history. And um, now we'll move on to some basic properties of the binormal curvature flow. So one thing is this, uh, there are three equations that are very closely related. And so um, one is this, this binormal curvature flow. The two others are um, on the one hand, this uh, cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and then this third equation, which is called the Schrodinger map equation. And so let me summarize the connections between them. Um, the transformation that converts, that relates uh, the binormal curvature flow and the uh, nonlinear Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation is really sort of mysterious and remarkable. And so it goes like this. Um, given a solution um, gamma of the binormal curvature flow, I can look at the um, curvature, uh, kappa, which will be a function of T and S, and the torsion, um, capital T. And uh, so then I can write down a complex valued function whose amplitude is the curvature and whose, 
uh, phase is the, is the antiderivative of the torsion. And then by this remarkable computation, it turns out that this uh, complex value function psi solves a one-dimensional cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, there's some details I'm sweeping under the cover. There's a, I'm free to choose the, the lower, um, in my, my starting point, my base point for the integration here. And so this, uh, this S naught has to be chosen carefully in order to uh, remove a constant here. But in any case, um, uh, this, in this fashion, can be transformed into this cubic analyst, which is, uh, um, so it's a, a mysterious and remarkable transformation. Um, the connection between, between these two equations is much, is much clearer. If I, um, if I simply set uh, u equal to d gamma ds, if I then differentiate this equation with respect to the parameter s, then I'll find easily that, um, that u satisfies uh, this so-called Schrodinger map equation. Here, here u is a unit vector because, of course, u is just the tangent, uh, the tangent to gamma, the unit tangent. Okay, so you, uh, you take some values in the sphere as two. Um, okay, so in, in particular, the, uh, and, and in general, the way these, there, so there are these three uh, related equations. Um, the way these are studied in general is that people uh, take the binomial curvature flow and the Schrodinger map equation, and they transform them into nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, and then they, uh, there's a, a huge amount of machinery developed for studying the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, and so they can then use this machinery to uh, get results here and then deduce things about these two things, about these uh, models. Um, okay. And so, and, and somehow this is easier to study because uh, one can, it, it's well adapted to uh, standard, uh, standard techniques in nonlinear dispersive equations. Um, so, and, and so this has some order transform, um, changing this into a nonlinear short equation has a number of consequences. Uh, for example, um, uh, say well postness results. These are theorems that one can prove about uh, this equation by changing it into NLS. Um, the the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is completely integrable, and so it uh, and so it has so-called solitons. There are structures that that uh, um, propagate without changing shape, and so a soliton on a vortex filament would look like. Okay, so using the Hasimoto transform, one can construct a solution to the binormal curvature flow. It looks like a curve with a kind of a corkscrew turn, uh, and then that propagate uh, with constant velocity without changing shape. Um, and so th the way this is done is by, again, transforming it into NLS, um, finding translating solutions in that setting, and then moving back. This was actually Hasimoto's interest. This was the, uh, the, um, uh, the consequence that he noted in his original paper. Um, because the, because the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is, uh, is integral, it possesses an infinite number of conserved quantities, and therefore the binormal curvature flow inherits an infinite number of conserved quantities, including the first ones would be arc length, uh, the integral of the curvature squared, and so on. And, and also, more generally, the binormal curvature flow is, is in some sense integrable um, as something that, is, that can be transformed into an integrable equation. Um, an, an interpretation of the Hasimoto transform is that this... Um, this was pointed out by Chang, Shatan, and Ulam back in 2000. It can be seen as a, um, as a choice of gauge on the tangent bundle to S2. Uh, I won't say any more about that. But this leads to some, uh, some generalizations of the Hasselman transform that are useful, for example, in studying Schrodinger maps in other settings. Okay, um, so more basic facts about the binormal curvature flow. Uh, I've, I described one solution in this circle translating with constant velocity. Uh, it, it turns out that another solution um, that one can write down rather explicitly is one that at time zero is just the union of two half lines. Um, and so this evolves in a self-similar fashion. This is the, uh, in, in fact, there's a one parameter family of such solutions parameterized by the angle theta. And uh, so this, uh, the sharp corner is the, the solution at time zero. Um, so these are well known and uh, a detailed analysis has been carried out by these authors using harmonic analysis techniques, stationary phase. Um, also, uh, Vega with another collaborator, Banica, has studied um, initial data that in some sense is a perturbation of this uh, corner and proved some um, results showing some stability properties of dynamics in that setting. Okay, 
So uh, I want to now, now move on to the main, uh, the main concern of this talk, which is to develop a notion of weak solutions for the binormal curvature flow. And uh, here are some of the motivations. Um, and so, as I said, the, the question of, of justifying the binormal curvature flow as a model for vortex filaments and fluids is really still open from a PD perspective. And so this notion of weak solution we hope may possibly be useful for, uh, for that open problem. It will turn out to yield new um, stability estimates for, uh, for Schrodinger maps. And um, I'll try to argue it gives new insight into irregular or oscillatory vortex filaments. Uh, the main, the, one of the motivations that we can see rather easily is that this will allow for changes of topology. And so um, we can imagine the following. If I, I could have a vortex filament that at some point intersects itself. Uh, in this case, I can, I can think of two uh, different possible scenarios. It can either pass through itself without, without noticing. Um, it can just uh, do this. And, and this is what, a, uh, uh, this is what, I will, what, what will always happen if I have a parameterized curve like this. Um, different points on the curve don't see that they're intersecting. Uh, or else, one can also suppose that the two, um, the two things would interact, um, break off, and, and that something more complicated might happen, as in this uh, scenario. This is what actually seems to happen in, 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 actual, in physical fluids in certain cases, the second, uh, the second possibility. And so uh, one wants to allow for a notion of solution, uh, one wants a notion of solution that allows for changes in topology, which can never happen if I insist on parameterizing my solution in a certain way. Okay, so we like a notion of solution that's independent of parameterization. And um, here's the basic idea. I'd like to view a curve evolving by the binormal curvature flow as a distribution acting on test functions. So I'll take a curve uh, as maybe integrated against a test function and ask what happens. Um, and so this is our perspective. And uh, so this is similar in spirit to um, geometric measure theory formulations of things like the minimal surface equation or uh, motion by mean curvature. Uh, and so the, um, the notions of weak solution are phrased in the length of, of what's called verifolds. And what we're introducing here could be called, say, an, an oriented verifold description of, uh, of the binormal curvature flow. So the basic calculation is this. I start with a smooth uh, function gamma solving this uh, e equation. And I, uh, I integrate, uh, uh, and then I, I consider a smooth uh, vector field phi with compact support. So I would like to integrate the vector field along the, along the curve gamma at a given time t, and then ask uh, how, does this, uh, uh, how does this integral change in t. So a short and rather easy computation shows that uh, this identity holds. Um, and so again, we're viewing the curve gamma as acting on, uh, on the test function in this way. And so on the, on the right-hand side, we have this expression involving uh, two derivatives of the test function phi uh, evo uh, evaluated along the curve gamma. And then I take the vector inner product with, uh, um, with the matrix which represents projection onto the tangent space here. Okay, and then this is some, uh, this has, we can see this has some kind of structure. Okay, and so the, the idea is that we will, will, we will in effect take this to be the definition of a weak um, binormal curvature flow uh, after some further reformulation. And so note first that, uh, and, and so uh, before giving the further reformulation, let me note, uh, in order to give a meaning to this, uh, all I need, you see, at no point do I see second derivatives of gamma. I only see first derivatives. Um, so the tangents here, the tangents here. And so, um, <clears throat> No second derivatives appear here. All I need for this, all I need to understand this is I need to know uh, where the curve is and what its tangent vectors are. And so what we will do then is to formulate a notion of kind of a generalized curve, uh, the weakest notion of generalized curve we can imagine that has a position and has uh, tangent vectors. And, uh, and then we'll uh, ask our weak solutions to satisfy an ad identity like this in the setting that I've just uh, described, and we'll state more precisely now. Okay, so um, okay, and so here's the class of generalized curves that possess only position and tangents. Um, and so what I want to do is uh, I'm going to eventually uh, my generalized curves will be measures on. Um, 
measures on R3 cross S2. Where S2, of course, knows the unit sphere in F3 dimensions. And so, um, and, and so the first point is given a, uh, and so to have any, to have a reasonable notion of a generalized curve, I have to first tell you how a, uh, a classical curve can be identified with such an object. And so again, my, and so what I want to do is, given, say, a Lipschitz continuous curve, um, let me uh, associate to it a measure on R3 cross S2. And the idea is that uh, generally uh, the measure V, if, if A is a subset of R3 and B is a subset of, a subset of the unit sphere, then the measure V of the subset of the set A cross B, the product set, will be the length of the portion of the curve that lies in the set A and has tangent vectors uh, belong to the set B. Okay? And so that's, that's exactly what this does uh, up here. Um, of course, I can define a measure by telling how by des describing how it acts on uh, on functions, and so the integral of function f on R three cross S two against the measure v sub gamma will be given in this way, and, and that that exactly uh, corresponds to this. Um, note for such a measure uh, coming from a closed Lipschitz curve gamma, one can rather easily check that uh, if I let the if I integrate the measure against test functions of this specific form. Um, where g is a smooth function, uh, that in this case I will get a zero. This is just integration by parts. And this expresses the fact that the curve has no boundary. Okay, and so, um, and so more generally I will, uh, I will, uh, I will, um, okay, so more generally I'll, I'll view any measure v on here as a general curve, as a, as a generalized curve. And again, this is the interpretation. And I'll say that v has no boundary if this, uh, that the measure has no boundary if this condition holds. Okay? So, um, and so this is, again, the weakest notion of a curve that, uh, that uh, says we can assign position and tangents to, uh, to the curve. And so having, uh, and, and so in this setting now we can give the definition of a weak solution, which is, um, so I have a family of, at every time t I have one of these measures on R3 cross S2. Uh, I ask that at every time t it has no boundary uh, in the weak sense we introduced above. Um, we ask that the total, the total mass be finite and um, non-increasing on the interval i. Uh, right, so here I'm considering, I guess, uh, uh, times in, in interval i. And then finally, this, this third condition expresses the identity that's uh, satisfied by a smooth solution. So we ask this, that this balance law hold. Okay, and so this is our, our notion of weak solution. Um, so here are some remarks. Uh, so some, some facts stated earlier immediately imply that if I have a, a smooth binormal curvature flow, uh, as over here, and uh, we look at the family of measures, the associated measures, then those will define a weak binormal curvature flow. So this is the first, uh, the first thing we will require of any notion of weak solution, that, the weak, that, that smooth solutions uh, <laughs> can be identified with that every smooth solution gives rise to a weak solution. Um, okay, as I'll argue later on in more detail, these weak flows, oops, these weak flows may be useful for describing uh, limits of sequences of solutions with rapid oscillations. And it's easy to construct examples of weak solution exhibiting change of topology. And so uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, um, either uh, this, is a, this, uh, this kind of behavior would be an admissible weak solution. Um, or, or this too is a misplaced solution. So we have a, so these are more a more flexible notion. Okay, so some uh, some basic results which are quite easy to prove. Did I? Uh, all right, I forgot to mention this. And so, note also the definition of weak solution is linear with respect to the measures v. This is quite striking because the equation is quite nonlinear, but here uh, v appears only linearly in this equation. So. Um, because it's linear, it's very easy to construct, to, to prove existence of weak solutions by um, approximating the weak solutions by smooth solutions and passing the limits. Okay, so we, we, um, we, rather, we, we very easily get existence results, say for any um, Lipschitz continuous initial data, 
there's a corresponding weak solution with the following properties that the the uh, the weak solution assumes the initial data in a certain weak sense. And um, the weak solution is continuous in a certain sense. And this, this point here, the uh, gamma sub t is an integer multiple theoretical hole occurrence for every t. Uh, one should think of this as, as asserting that the weak solution has a, has a kind of a reasonable geometric structure. That's uh, the claim. And uh, in fact, for the, uh, the existence theorem also yields uh, solutions such that the, the mass is constant. Um, which is a nice property. Uh, uniqueness, however, um, doesn't hold at all. So there are many sources and examples of non-uniqueness. The first is that the definition of a weak solution involves only, um, you know, the, the, we have measures on here and here. Uh, in the S2 variable, it involves only the first and second moments. And so um, one can well have measures uh, V sub T on S2 whose first and second moments are identical, but who are themselves quite different. Um, and so this is a clear source of non-uniqueness. This may be a difficulty in the formulation rather than an uh, intrinsic problem. Um, as we said earlier, the, the collisions and self-intersections essentially always give rise to non-uniqueness. So when, whenever there's a collision, we have the choice of either the, um, the things passing through each other or splitting off. Um, the, also, the definition of the weak solution doesn't constrain evolution of second moments, and so this uh, gives rise to further uniqueness. There's also no possibility of uniqueness if mass is allowed to increase. Here's another example of a weak solution. Um, as, I, as I've uh, said several times, um, a circle moving with constant velocity is a smooth solution. Uh, an example of a weak solution is if, if I take two circles moving with constant velocity and I aim them at each other, at a certain time they'll collide, and then there are two possibilities. Either they pass through each other or else they can annihilate each other and vanish. Um, and so the, this, uh, this anni annihilation is a possibility for a weak solution. If I allowed the mass to increase, then I could, have the, I could run time backwards and I could have pairs of vortex rings being born out of a vacuum and moving in opposite directions. And so um, if I allow the mass to increase, then for any initial data, um, someplace else, these vortex rings could be born and could cause problems. Or whatever. So, uh, so this is why our definition of weak solution insists that the mass is not allowed to increase. Uh, okay, so there, there are all these problems with uniqueness. Um, despite that, and this is the first of our main results, um, we have the following theorem. And um, so here's the result. And what this says is that, uh, so we assume that we have a smooth, uh, a smooth solution gamma. And so this says that at every time it has uh, three derivatives um, that are bounded. Uh, and, and so this is, a, this is a certain smoothest condition, if you're not familiar with the, with the language. And um, then we consider a, a weak binaural curvature flow. And the assertion is that if the smooth flow agrees with the weak flow at time zero, then in fact the smooth flow agrees with the weak flow for all times, as long as the, uh, as long as the smooth flow doesn't intersect itself. And so as soon as there's an intersection, we don't know what happens, but until then, um, they coincide. Uh, the proof actually yields something stronger. It shows that... Uh, the proof shows that, so it yields a kind of a stability. It says that if I take a, a rough perturbation of a smooth flow, then the, um, the perturbation will remain close to the smooth flow for some time. And uh, as remarked again, self-intersection always leads to non-uniqueness. Uh, uniqueness fails if the mass is allowed to increase. And the regularity here is much weaker than in the work of Banach and Vega. Okay, let me show you uh, more numerics illustrating the stability property. So... Uh, let's see, I think we've... And so here we'll see something that doesn't look very interesting, actually. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see there are two curves, a red curve and a green curve. And one of them is, um, one of them is a perturbation, the other one. And so, uh, as predicted by our theorem, well, the two, cur the two curves stay very close to each other. Um, so nothing much is happening of interest. Uh, the thing is, if you, if you look carefully, you can see the red curve, I believe, has lots of tiny oscillations, uh, I think. And the green curve is quite smooth. And so um, we'll see what's going on a bit better in the next simulation. Um, so this was, the, uh, this was the binormal curvature flow. If I, look at the, if I look at the derivative, the time derivative, where is it? If I look at the tangents, so 
so the next uh, picture will show the same, um, the, same, uh, the same initial data, but showing the behavior of the tangents rather than the um, curves. And let's... Uh, Let's see. Uh, that's uh, okay. So here's the uh, and so what you can see here the way the way the initial data differs is that we uh, uh, the smooth curve is just an ellipse. And so the, the, uh, the tangents are on the uh, equator um, in the exponent plane. And, we, and so for the, I guess in this one, the rough curve is the green curve. Um, for the green fog, what we did is we just went into the, we went into the, uh, we had this ellipse. And, um, and we just took one point and moved it up out of the, out of the plane. And so there's one, um, there's one tangent which is vertical in the uh, pointing in the upward vertical direction. Uh, that would be on the north pole here. And then a tangent pointing in the downward vertical direction. And then everything else is, is as before. And so we can see, although this is a small perturbation, it's a very rough perturbation of the, of the curve. And so, and so um, this simulation looks much more dramatic than the other one. Um, and so on the level of the Schrodinger maps, you can see something quite, uh, quite striking is happening. Um, and uh, this is the, and so this illustrates the stability result that we have stability even with respect to very rough perturbations. Um, and uh, let's let this finish. And, and so somehow uh, the, uh, the interest of this is that we're able to, ha able to work with um, very low regularity. That's, the, that's sort of the point. Okay. Uh, and so um, another theorem in the same spirit is, uh, so the first theorem dealt with this equation, the second theorem um, concerns this equation. And the difference here somehow is that in the in the first case, we uh, um, in the first case we uh, we uh, on the one hand we have very weak solutions, but we um, we only deal with the uh, with the with the weak flow here, and so uh, and so there's this uh, issue with self intersections. In the second case, uh, when I'm solving this equation, I, I really insist that the uh, the function u be parameterized always as a, as a function from the uh, one-dimensional torus of the unit sphere into S2. And so, uh, and so here I always have a parameterization. I, I no longer uh, worry about self-intersections. And um, so, and, and what we're doing here is essentially translating the earlier results into, um, in, uh, from here into the Schrodinger map. But also, also uh, uh, we have to work to uh, eliminate problems that arose earlier with self-intersections. And so what this says is, um, Again, the setup is I, I start with a smooth solution. Uh, so here, again, this is the smoothest condition. Um, so I have a smooth U and a rough V. Uh, here V belongs to essentially the, uh, this is the uh, weakest um, function space in which one can easily make sense of, of a solution for this equation. Um, and so the point is that, and so the theorem says that if, if U and V are close at time zero, then uh, in the L2 norm, um, then, U and, uh, then U is close to a, uh, a translation of V in the L2 norm at, at a later time T. Um, and, uh, so this is the result. The, some remarks here is that uh, people who work in this, uh, in this field, this uh, nonlinear dispersive equations, uh, place a great emphasis on, on these uh, so-called scaling. And uh, and so they would and so there are the, these family of function spaces H S, uh, with a parameter S up here, and so uh, and so from from the point of view of nonlinear dispersive equations, the critical solvable space is H one half. Um, here we're considering L two, which is this is H zero. It's, it's well below H one half, and so again the interest here is that 
um, we have extremely weak regularity compared to, uh, compared to what you would expect from scaling. This is, why, uh, this is why we don't actually prove continuity in L2. We prove continuity in L2 modular translations. Uh, but what this shows is that somehow the only, the only obstacle in the subcritical setting to continuity is the freedom that comes from translations. Uh, or in the language of, um, of nominator dispersive equations, this, the, uh, the, this arises from the Galilean invariance of the equation. Okay, and uh, let me say very briefly, the way we, um, uh, the way we prove this is we, uh, given a solution u, we, um, if, of course, if I integrate this uh, u, I can recover the gamma. Uh, if I choose a constant uh, correctly, I choose constant integration. And so given a u, we, we uh, integrate it to get the gamma. We do this for both the smooth and the rough, solu rough solution. Uh, we then uh, apply a sort of an upgraded version of our earlier estimate. And the, and the point is, our earlier estimate um, is only records the geometric closeness, but it doesn't record the, it doesn't know, um, uh, it doesn't know uh, anything about the parameterization. And so uh, knowing that the two curves are geometrically close, I, I, can't, uh, I can't control it all. This, uh, this extra uh, translational degree of freedom sigma. And so uh, that's where this arises from. And, and uh, so that's uh, just an idea of the proof. Then finally, um, let, me, let me remark that uh, this translational degree of freedom here is in some way um, necessary. So the above theorem is not true without the translation sigma. And uh, this is a statement to that effect. Uh, so one can construct examples where um, uh, to show that the translation uh, can be non-zero. Uh, that's what this says. Uh, we don't need to uh, look read it in more detail. OK, so um, let me say a little bit about the proof. And, uh, but again, let me emphasize that, as I said, there are these three, uh, these three equations who are all cousins, the Schrodinger, uh, so, so the binormal curvature flow, uh, the Schrodinger map, and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And actually, in essentially all previous work that we know of, the direction has been to translate the, the binormal curvature flow and the Schrodinger map into the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, study things there, and then translate back. And so um, the, the things that we do here are sort of the only, uh, the only argument we know of that's, that's easier to do and gives you more insight in the setting of the, uh, the geometric evolution problem, the curvature flow, than in the nonlinear Schrodinger setting. OK, so the key idea is this. Um, so again, my, uh, the, uh, my assumption is I have a rough, uh, I have a smooth curve, um, little gamma, <coughs> and a weak solution, and I want to control the, uh, uh, the deviation of the smooth and the, and the weak solution, the, 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 how they grow with each other. And so, um, and so remember, the, the definition of weak solution involves So for the definition of weak solution, I have to take a test vector field X and, um, and integrate it against the measures V sub T and use that to get information. And so what we will do then is use the smooth curve, little, uh, little gamma, this is, um, we'll use the smooth curve to construct a, um, a test function and we'll use the rough curve uh, here. And so, uh, and so we're using the equation in two ways. We're using the smooth equation for the uh, vector field. Um, the, the fact that our vector field is constructed around a smooth solution will give it certain good properties. And we're using the rough solution um, in, uh, for this integral identity. OK, and so how do we construct the, uh, this vector field x? Uh, what we want to do is, well, um, here's the functional we consider in the end. And so let's see. I'll uh, just draw a picture. So um, we construct this vector field x sub gamma as follows. Uh, so here, um, p of x is the uh, the nearest point projection of x onto onto the curve gamma. And then, uh, and so what we do is we look at the unit tangent gamma sub s at p of x. And 
And then um, we, uh, we weight this by a function f that uh, is 1. So f is like uh, 1 minus r squared, at least, at least near the curve. Um, OK. And so, uh, and so then let me look at this integrand. Um, I claim that, and so we think of this as being a uh, kind of a relative entropy of the rough curve v, which is really just a measure, with respect to the smooth curve gamma. Um, let me argue, uh, let me ar try to argue why this is true. And so the claim is that, it, for example, if v has no boundary and this relative entropy is zero, then uh, the measure of v is a constant multiple of the measure associated to the smooth curve gamma. Okay, um, I'll try to persuade you this is the case. And so the, uh, right, this, this C uh, is a unit vector, right? It lives in S2. And this X sub gamma is a vector whose length is less than or equal to one, right? So it's, the, it's this unit tangent multiplied by a factor who's uh, less than or equal to one. And so um, this, this dot product is, a, is at most one. And, uh, when can, and, so, uh, and so I can see the integrand is non-negative. Uh, when, uh, let's ask, when can the integrand vanish? The integrand vanishes if exactly, um, well, for the integrand to vanish, I need, so, so I need, um, this better be true um, for the dot product equal one. Um, and so this says that the distance is zero. Um, and so that says that x is actually on the curve gamma. And, uh, and then we need um, c to equal um, c to equal, I guess, the unit tangent. Okay, and so uh, if, uh, and so if this entropy is zero, then the integrand vanishes identically. And that says that the integrand is supported. It says that the measure v is supported at points x that lie on the curve and that the, uh, and with uh, tangents, with, with vectors c that are tangent to the curve at that point. Okay, and so this, uh, and so, so from this one can believe that the, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's then not so hard to prove that, uh, uh, that this holds by invoking some theorems from geometric measures there. Okay, so, um, and so the point is that we, we define this quantity and then uh, the mysterious fact is that using the definition of weak solution, we can control the growth, the, the growth in time of this entropy. So here's the key fact that under the hypothesis of the weak strong uniqueness theorem, uh, we have this, um, this differential inequality. So the uh, growth in time of, the, of this entropy of the a uh, rough curve with respect to the smooth curve is bounded by a constant times the entropy itself. Okay, so then we can easily use what's called Grunwald's inequality to conclude that this grows at most exponentially. And in, in particular, if this entropy is zero at time zero, then it remains zero for all times. And this constant k depends only on certain norms of the smooth curve. Uh, okay, so, um, and the proof of this key fact is a computation which, as I said, uses the, um, uses the equation twice. And so, uh, the point is because this curve, because this vector field x sub gamma is defined, we have to use the fact. You see, what do I do? I, um, well, yeah, we have to use the equation. Um, uh, so the fact that this x sub gamma is built around a smooth solution means that it will have certain good properties. Uh, and that works out um, surprisingly well. Okay, so uh, in the remaining time, let me talk about a few more uh, different things. And so I. Uh, so this is to move on to a slightly different topic. I've argued that the, um, our notion of weak solution may also be useful for understanding the behavior of curves with rapidly oscillating data. And so um, let's consider this as follows. So here, I uh, suppose I'm given a smooth curve gamma naught. I can define a, a new curve um, as follows. And so this, uh, so what I've done here, I, I, this, uh, the new curve will, will oscillate around uh, around gamma naught, the, the, the tangents to the, 
um, the tangents to this gamma sub k, k and alpha. And you see, as k increases, um, I have uh, rapid oscillations um, of smaller size. And, and so the, and the tangents, roughly speaking, the tangents to this gamma sub uh, k comma alpha form a fixed angle with the tangents to the smooth curve gamma naught. They wind around it. Okay. And so we can ask, um, uh, as k goes to infinity, uh, how do the uh, how do solutions of this with this initial data behave? Um, and so and we don't know, but we have, but our our perspective gives rise to some interesting uh, possibilities. And so here are two possibilities. Um, an obvious possibility is that you see here I have extremely high curvature. The curvature is like uh, I think k. Uh, the curvature is, is of order k, I guess. And so as k is to infinity, I have very big curvatures. And one might express this to cause extreme instability. Uh, on the other hand, we could uh, think of it the following way. Um, so if I consider the curves uh, gamma, k, alpha, and I look at the associated measures, uh, I can ask how do those behave. And these measures converge as uh, k goes to infinity to a limiting measure, um, which is supported on a, cert on a set like this. You see here, um, uh, If I, if I consider the, um, the measure ab above a point x on the curve, I'll see the, uh, the measure supported on a, on a sort of a line of, uh, that forms a constant angle with a tangent. Okay, so it's, uh, the measure is supported on a set of this form. And so um, we can find, and so there are actually explicit weak solutions of the, of explicit solutions of the weak binormal curvature flow with this data. Um, and so this explicit solution is supported on actually a set of the same form. Um, uh, again, the, uh, the tangents are uh, the sort of the, the um, you see this, the support of the tangent reflects the fact that, reflects the oscillations in the approximating sequence. And so what happens here is that the, um, for the V star T, the, uh, the oscillations cause a rescaling in time. So here I have, um, so the, uh, the limiting solution at a time uh, t is related to the original solution at time at time beta, so beta t, where beta is a factor that depends on the parameter alpha. And so, uh, what this uh, for this uh, for this v sub lim, um, what happens is that as, as the alpha increases, as the and so al and so this is increasing the angle of the oscillator things. As alpha increases, um, then this, uh, the effect of this is to slow or even to reverse the flow of time uh, compared to the smooth solutions. And so uh, we don't have any proofs, but one can ask, does this describe a uh, limit of smooth solutions? And again, let me show some numerical simulations. And so uh, actually, I, I had expected before we did the numerics that this would be the case. But to, to my surprise, uh, here we see So here again, I'm comparing a smooth curve and this uh, very oscillatory curve. And what we'll see is that the, the smooth curve and the oscillatory curve seem to be following sort of the same trajectory, but the red curve is moving more slowly, um, which is consistent with the, earlier, with the prediction from our, uh, with the, at least the possibility that's raised by our uh, weak formulation. And so, uh, and so this suggests that the second possibility, the, the, uh, um, that the oscillations are persisting in a stable fashion and slowing or reversing the flow of time, is what actually happens. Uh, and so this is a conjecture that we would like to prove very much. OK, and then finally, um, uh, let me just show one last numerical result. There, there are a lot of uh, interesting phenomena here that we don't understand. And so here's another one. Um, let's see. And so here I want to consider um, a very non-smooth initial data. So this is um, uh, this is the uh, if I it's uh, if I take a cube and look at certain look at certain edges of cube. Okay, this is uh, you can see uh, these are this is uh, half of a cube. And let's look at the evolution. One thing that happens here is that the, uh, the behavior at the corners is very close to what one sees in the, 
uh, the self-similar solutions that I showed earlier, and also um, at times it right. So it uh, uh, I, I was too late, but it, it, it at a certain time it becomes an equilateral triangle. Um, we have no we we. I guess it's safe to say we have no reason, why, no idea why this is true. Um, and uh, so the numerics suggest a lot of interesting phenomena that we don't understand. And uh, I guess we'll stop here. Uh, and I, I should say, you know, in some sense the equation is integral, as we said before. Uh, and so, uh, and so, if we look at it from that point of view, it's not surprising that mysterious uh, things should happen and should, it should uh, exhibit um, uh, exhibit unexpectedly good behavior. But um, the regularity here is, is far too low to make sense of the integrability. And so uh, understanding this is a challenging and interesting question. Okay, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>